Hey, everybody, and welcome to Grace to Gratitude. Oh, my God, what a journey this has been. It's been such a wonderful time to bring people together on this journey to hear stories and to share our thoughts and our ideas about why this is such a powerful topic and particularly now. As you can see, I'm not alone. I have a wonderful guest with me today, Tom Zuba. Tom, hey, welcome. Hi, it's nice to be here. Thank you, thank you. And by the way, for anyone who um, hasn't yet had an opportunity to tune into the um, conversation that Tom and I had on Awake TV this week. I invite you to do that. And we'll talk more about that at the end of the program. But so if his face looks um, familiar to you and you hadn't met him before, that's where you've seen it in all of our uh, postings. And of course, had you tapped into that program, which was extremely powerful. But we want to continue our conversation today. We want to talk about this whole um, phenomenon about how grace actually brings us to this place of gratitude where our hearts are just broken open and overflowing with an energy and a level of the energy that really aligns us to the God consciousness itself. So, Without further ado, Tom, I know you have so much to share with us. Please, it's all yours. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. I was raised Catholic, so the word grace has always been on my radar screen. I mean, one of the prayers we say is, is Holy Mary, Mother of God. I, I can't even, the Hail Mary, oh, isn't that funny? Hail Mary, full of grace. Hail Mary, full of grace. That tells you how far removed I am from my Catholicism. It's been a while since you've. My, since you my mother one. and my grandmother. My grandmother. Oh. But grace has been on my radar screen. And if you know anything about me, if you were able to listen to the conversation that Marcy and I had in 1990, my firstborn child, my 18 month old daughter, Erin died suddenly in the hospital. I wasn't there with her and I'm so grateful that I wasn't, which might sound odd, but I am. I'm so grateful that I wasn't there, that I didn't witness the chaos that my wife did. Erin's death destroyed me. It shattered me. I did not believe that I could return to any sense of normalcy whatsoever. So she died in 1990. In 91, the next year, we had a, a, a second baby. Our son Rory was born. And interestingly, that first Thanksgiving that we walked through with a dead daughter was the day that Trish found out she was pregnant. Wow. Yeah, she found out on Thanksgiving morning. That was a big shift. That was when I knew that complete and utter desperation and hopelessness could reside with a little bit of hope. Yes. That was important. So Rory was born in 91. Our son, Sean, was born in 95. I know there's a lot of people that don't like the term a new normal. I love the term a new normal because that is all I wanted. I wanted to be normal, normal, normal. And I felt like we did get to a place that was normal. And I was very, very grateful. So that fall of 98, uh, my business is public relations and marketing. My job, as I shared in the conversation you and I had, was to watch the Oprah Winfrey show every morning at 9 a.m. in Chicago. It was live. And she introduced us to this guy named Gary Zukoff, who wrote this book called The Seat of the Soul. And Oprah said it was the most important book she had ever read. 
Based on that recommendation, I ordered it from this thing called Amazon. I didn't even know what Amazon was. And I want to read, this is the book, and I want to show you the highlights. There's a part that I read and I was stopped in my tracks. If a child dies early in its life, we do not know what agreement was made between that child's soul and the soul of its parents. Yes or what healing was served by that experience. Marcy, I recognize that as truth, but I thought, oh my Lord, let me read that again. Let me read that again. Let me read that again. And what's really, really interesting, I shared that with my wife. It went in one ear and out the other. Why? Because on some level, she knew she was getting ready to leave the planet. She did not need that information. So this was the fall of 98. Right after Christmas of 98, I've, I'm afraid my wife is either having a heart attack or a stroke. I call 911. I ride in the ambulance. We're in the emergency room of Oak Park Hospital in Oak Park, Illinois. And she is going down, 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 down. They were so confused that they asked me, this is in 1998, for permission to test my wife for AIDS. That's how desperate they were. I said, of course. I said, I promise you she doesn't have AIDS, but sure. They said, we don't, we don't know. We have no clue what else might be going on. So there was a procedure that the doctor said he could do. He thought that there were, um, that there was a clot that was blocking the blood from flowing. So he said, I'm going to, you know, put a little tube in with a little camera and I'm going to try to just dislodge the clot and get things going again. But he said to me, you need to realize that she is so compromised that there is a really, really good chance she will not survive the procedure. Mm. This is, this is uh, New Year's Eve. I have a three-year-old and a seven-year-old. Wow. And I said to him, if we don't do the procedure, what's going to happen? He said, she's going to die. Yeah. I said, do the procedure, do the procedure. No sure. I had no choice. <clears throat> he did the procedure. It lasted about two hours. He came out and I could tell by the look on his face that she was alive, but things didn't look good. So I said, what happened? What happened? He said, your wife is still alive, but I was not able to do what I hoped to be able to do. So I said, so nothing has changed. And he said, nothing. He literally said to me, get everyone you know to pray for a miracle. The only thing that will save your wife is a miracle. Okay. I literally made a list of the people that I knew that I thought were good prayers, praying people. I had my niece and my sister call them and say, we need prayers. We need prayers. We need prayers. We need prayers. That was when I believed that prayer could change the perfect mind of God. Desperate people do desperate things. <clears throat> there was a moment, a couple minutes when I was all by myself and I thought, okay, Tom, what is your prayer? What is your prayer? Now keep in mind, I have a dead daughter. Yeah. I have a wife who is in the process of dying. Yeah. I have a three-year-old. I have a seven-year-old. And I had read this book. If a child dies early in its life, we do not know what agreement was made between that child's soul and the soul of its parents. If a spouse dies early in the marriage, we do not know what agreement was made between the husband and the wife. 
and what healing was served by that experience. There was only one prayer, one prayer. I literally, I literally reached my arms out. I looked up because I believed God was up back then. Right. And I said, thy will be done. 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 12 hours later, we literally took my wife off the ventilator. It was a decision that I made and my wife left her physical body. Mm -hmm. On New Year's day, I told my three-year-old and my seven-year-old that their mother died. My seven-year-old Rory understood the concept and he wept and he wept and he wept mm -hmm. and he ran as far from me as he possibly could. My three-year-old looked me right in the eye. He put both of his hands on my cheeks and he said, well, daddy, then you're gonna have to be our parent now. Wow. I, Yikes. somehow, some way, picked out a casket, planned the most glorious celebration of her life. I videotaped it because I wanted to show the kids what mm -hmm. I had created as a celebration of their mother's life. I intentionally scheduled her funeral on January 6th, the Feast of the Epiphany. It was winter in Chicago. It was cold. There was a huge storm. The church was packed. Mm. There were, um, it was standing room only at her visitation. We did a two day visitation from two in the afternoon to nine at night. That's how the Irish do it in Oak Park, with standing room only. This is the gratitude. This is the gratitude. I literally, I had Rory by the hand, I had Sean by the hand, and we walked behind their mother's dead body in the casket as we processed up to the altar of old St. Pat's Church in downtown Chicago. And with every cell of my body, every cell of my body, I knew, Marcy, that my entire life had prepared me for this moment. My entire life had prepared me for this moment. That is grace. That is gratitude. That is the power of divine connection. I wanna make this clear to anybody that is living with the death of someone they love. Did that make the journey easier? No, it didn't. The journey was walking through hell, walking through hell, walking through hell. But every so often, I got glimpses and I got glimmers of what at a soul level I knew was truth. If a child, if a parent, if a spouse dies, we do not know what agreements have been made between that soul and the souls of the people that are loved and loved. And we don't know what healing can be served by that experience. It was that truth. It was that truth that made all the difference in the world for me. And has continued to, particularly in light of the fact that in 2005, my oldest son, that seven-year-old, died from a terminal brain cancer. Right. It's just inconceivable, seriously. And yet I've lived it. Well, yes, you lived it. Um, what to me is so apparent in terms of identifying grace and how it works 
it's like every step of the way yeah that forgive me but like that crap was going to happen it was going to happen but every step along the way <clears throat> The orchestration of the universe, the spirit was completely carrying you, making certain that you were getting what you would need to keep yourself afloat, right? And to keep you grounded at the same time. So when we look at this, I mean, you can't help but say, oh my God, like, how are you, how are you sitting here in front of me in this moment? How did you just not completely give up, fall apart, right? But it is so incredible when you think about it. When you think about the fact that your job, your job was to listen, was to watch Oprah every single morning at nine o'clock. We know what Oprah has done for this world. She brought spirituality to a place where we actually received tools and support and and permission to step outside of whatever confines we had in terms of our own belief systems, right? So your job, you actually got paid to watch Oprah every single morning. <laughs> and so every day you're getting another dose, another dose, another dose. What's amazing also is for you to have this this recognition on a conscious level as you were walking behind your wife's casket in that procession was that this somehow had to do with the rest of your life that this was going to be meaningful now you had no idea what was going to happen to rory you didn't know you were going to be faced with this yet again but what you knew on this very intuitive level was that this in fact every single one of these little pieces was actually preparing you for your life's purpose you might not have been able to put it into those words but when you even think about the fact that you were reading gary's book right and that the epiphany that you had when you read those words one gave you permission to let go of your daughter on yet another level. But it also prepared you for what was coming for your wife. But not only let go of her on a physical level, but with my arms wide open, yes. welcome her on a spiritual level. Yes. Knowing, knowing that if I could welcome Aaron on a spiritual level, I would be able to welcome Trish on that same spiritual level. That knowing was somewhere amongst the angst and the hopelessness and you got to be kidding me. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Incredible. And yet it's the perfect example of how grace works. It's like this continuous river. It just keeps going. And sometimes we're aware that we're on the river and sometimes we're not. Sometimes, you know, and I get this image of like being in one of those big tubes, right? And sometimes you're like knocking against the rocks. Sometimes you get stuck, right? The tube gets stuck on a rock, but eventually the current will take you if you will position yourself to be taken. And, and where I am now, <laughs> you know, after 63 years of bumping into rocks, oh. I honestly, honestly, honestly know at my core, core, core level that I am loved so deeply that life happens for me always, always, particularly when, especially when it doesn't appear or it doesn't seem like life is happening for me. I release, I exhale, I surrender, and I kind of look around and ask myself, how is this happening for me? Yeah. You know, what is the belief I'm holding on to that I can shift and remind myself that yes, this too is happening for me because I'm loved so much. It's been a practice, but it is very easy for me to do that now. Yeah at least very easy to recognize when you're out of it. Well, because it's pain, yes. it's painful. 
And yeah. I, rather than stuff, repress, numb the pain, mm -hmm. the pain comes right up and I look at it and I go, something is off here and that something would be it's me. me. <laughs> and the story that I'm telling myself that this shouldn't be happening. Yeah. Well, apparently it should be happening because it is happening. That's right. Yeah. Time to tweak the energy. Yes, absolutely. But how remarkable that here we are, right? We're talking about all of this in one sense, in hindsight. In another sense, it's very much right here, right now. Because as you said, it's a journey, right? Like you couldn't take all that in at one time. It was a progressive evolution within you, those around you, um, your place in the world, how you manifested and, and extended the light from within you. And like you said, it's still happening. You're still number one, obviously in deep relationship with yourself. Number two, in deep relationship with your daughter, your wife, your son, and of course your son here on the earth, right? Who's sharing this space with you and other loved ones that are here and some that are in another, in another dimension, another realm. Yes. And yet the relationships remain active. And, and, and I don't want to forget about the relationship that I have with the universe itself. And with the universe itself. Absolutely. I, I, have, I have a living, breathing, fluid relationship with life itself. It's a dance that I'm aware of every single day and it makes me really, really excited to get up in the morning. Yeah. And how amazing that we can sit here, we can talk about this, the depths of your pain um, and the heights of your celebration. We can laugh about it. We can cry. We can feel it. We can observe it. We can really still be engaged in every level. That to me is the river. That to me is grace that is always there and carries us to this place, as I said, where I can, I can feel it like oozing from you. You are in a place of sheer gratitude. If you were to have this conversation with somebody who's not able to hear it, they would think you are absolutely insane or they would think you were closed off completely and in la la land someplace. And, and I would say to them, you don't have a clue who I am. That's right. And you're also not really paying attention to what I've lived through. That's right. What, what I am most grateful for, what I am most grateful for, that the agreements that I made prior to coming to the planet did not include ending my own life. Mm. I'm grateful for that. Yes. And I honor and respect and, and actually in awe of those people whose agreements did include ending their own life. Yeah. I am at the beginning of my work. I know this much. Mm -hmm. I have set the intention on a daily basis to continue to expand, to continue to expand, to continue to expand. One of the things that I share with the people that I work with one-on-one -on -one who might not believe that this is possible. Right. I say, I remember being in the deepest, darkest, seemingly bottomless, seemingly hopeless pit of despair when I never believed I would be happy again. And the thought of experiencing joy, ridiculous, yeah. insulting, absurd. Now in 2021, because I have not forgotten that, when I do experience happiness, when I do experience joy, it is richer, 
it is more powerful, it is more potent, because I clearly, clearly remember the times when I never thought that that would be available to me. The, the highs that we experience are in direct proportion to the lows that we've experienced. That's life. That's yeah. life. That is life. And amazing. I mean, here you are now. You're an author, a teacher. You are a life coach. You are such an incredible... Oh, I guess, how would I describe you? Visionary? mystic in some ways. I mean, you just, um, you have so much to share and to give. And if it weren't for those experiences, well, we don't know, do we? We don't know what well, else the universe would have dished up, but all it, we know is that whatever you've had on your dish, it has worked. The, yes, <laughs> it has the, brought you yes. to the most amazing place. The only thing that we know is this is the life that I have lived. Yes. And I have surrendered to it and embraced it. And I have said, yes, 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 yes. What can I learn? How can I expand? How can I continue to grow? I came to the planet to love and be loved. I came to the planet to experience all that the divine has created. And I came to the planet, like all of us, to be a teacher and a student, a teacher and a student. I know some good stuff and I'm happy to teach it, but I'm also a very humble student because like I said, I know I'm just at the beginning. I'm just at the beginning. Yes. I am just beginning to realize how powerful, how powerful, powerful we are as human beings when we're open to co-creating our life with the power of the universe. It's very clear to me that that which is going to hold me back would be me. That's right. And as I've said many, many times, the blessing of my life is I have suffered enough. <laughs> I have suffered for years and most of it was self-created out of ignorance. I didn't know any better. Yeah. I have suffered enough. I did not come here to the planet to suffer. Neither did anybody else. We came here to live radiant lives. That's right. I'm living a radiant life. I want it to be brighter and brighter and brighter and brighter. And I'll be honest with you, Marcy, that drives a lot of people who are living with the death of their children, living with the death of a spouse, it drives them insane. Of course it does. How dare I suggest right. that we can live radiant lives? Don't I know what happened to them? I know what happened to me. I have two dead children and a dead wife. Right. I know what happened to me and I have a father who passed away and I have a brother that passed away. Mm -hmm. I know death, I know grief. As a result, I know life. It is worth living, <laughs> it is worth living. And it is worth co-creating radiant, glorious, light-filled lives. That's why we came. Yeah. And now more than ever, that's what's being called forth. Oh, thank you so much for that. Tom, do you have any words of inspiration for people for Thanksgiving? I do. Now, I think everybody is um, feeling some sense of separation, right? Either from themselves, from the world in some ways, <clears throat> their family, friends, some have, um, you know, experienced death you know, all around them in their families um, and extended families. What can we say to help them to lighten their load that they carry with them into this Thanksgiving time? Who would you be if you decided to believe that you are in the perfect place, mm. that you are in the absolute perfect place. And that, I want, I'm going to grab something. And that you are being lovingly 
lovingly, lovingly helped. Mm. Who would you be and what would it feel like? And it's a decision that we make that you decided to believe today when you hear this, That's that right. you are being lovingly held by love itself. You are being lovingly held by love itself. If you can lean into that, then try to open your ears, open your eyes, open your heart to this. I'm gonna ask you to make a list of what it is you need this Thanksgiving. I need someone to send me a Thanksgiving card. I need a special phone call to know that I'm not being forgotten. I need someone to call me up and invite me for a walk. Either Thursday, Friday, Saturday, or Sunday. It's going to be a long four days. I need someone to send me a text so I know I'm not alone. Literally, I dare you, make a list of what it is you need. Open your heart and honestly say, I'm going to give first what it is I would like to receive. I would like to receive a card. I'm going to send a card. I would like to go for a walk. Who do I know that's sitting in their home right now, lonely, who would love an invitation from me to go on a walk with them? Who could I call up and make their day on Thanksgiving? Who could I surprise with a text? We're not victims. None of us are victims. We are co-creators. Identify what it is you hope for, what it is you wish for, give it to somebody else. That will make you feel so, so, so good this Thanksgiving weekend. And you will bless three, four, five other people. We can change the world. Yes, we can. If we're willing to take responsibility for ourselves and for our experience, we can either walk on a subconscious level sleepily through the next four or five or six days, or we can open up our eyes, open up our heart and say, what do I want to create? What do I want to create? How do, how, how do I touch my heart? by touching the hearts of other people that I care about. That's my message for Thanksgiving. It's a beautiful one. And I'm so grateful to that. And I know that it was grace that brought us together. So it was a shared newsletter, shared with somebody else, shared with me. And I said, oh, I looked at him and I said, perfect, perfect for this time. I've been so blessed to have you um, on both the um, television show, The Spirit of Healing Unleashed, and here with me now on Grace to Gratitude. And I look forward to so many more conversations. Um, again, I'm, I'm really truly honored. And I know that this message and its ripple effects will go around the world. Touching that's our, every that's our that's our intention that's our hope that's right so everyone listening um oh tom how can everybody reach you thanks for asking my, my last name is zuba z-u-b-a do not let autocorrect change it to zumba <laughs> so you go to tomzuba.com that's where you'll where that's where you'll find everything you need to know great and they can also find you on Facebook? Yes, Facebook, YouTube. In fact, I'm going to be live on YouTube at 11 a.m. Central for an hour on Thanksgiving. Oh. And if you come to my website and you subscribe to my newsletter at 4 p.m. Central on Thanksgiving Day, I'm going to have a Zoom gathering 
anyone that's interested, you're welcome. I have a beautiful, beautiful candle lighting ceremony. We're gonna light four candles and we're going to gather together for about 20 minutes to soak in each other's energy and be grateful. How beautiful. And I think particularly anyone listening to this, if you are in grief or mourning, please tune in, get the nourishment and the nurturing that your heart is yearning for. I'm certain that that will be such a beautiful ceremony. So thank you for those gorgeous offerings. You're welcome. And of course, anyone who has any comments or questions, please leave them below. Tom and I both love to get those. And if you'd like to reach out to me, you can do so through my website, which is heartshiftcoach.com. And I look forward, <clears throat> excuse me, until next time. Have a wonderful day. Goodbye, everybody. And Take thanks care, everybody. for being here. You're welcome. You're very welcome. Thank you.